Trees are miracles of life. They can survive for centuries. Their leaves turn sunlight into sugars and produce the oxygen we breathe. In Britain, half of all broadleaf trees grow in towns and cities, where they improve the quality of our lives enormously. But many thousands of them are being destroyed every year. Building work, poisonous weed killers, trenching around their roots, and sheer neglect are doing irreversible damage. Entire streets are losing their trees. If the destruction continues, urban living could be very bleak. So there's now an urgent battle on for the fate of Britain's city trees. development process kills thousands out of ignorance every year. Over the last two years, five different utility companies have been down this street, digging their trenches, chopping their way through the roofs. They're really, most of them, orphans. Once they're planted, they're just left to their own devices. <laughs> Imagine our streets without trees. City living would be almost unbearable. Trees soften the harsh lines of buildings and bring beauty into town. They cool the air in summer and keep it warm in winter. Their foliage filters pollution and absorbs loud noise. They help wildlife to thrive amongst buildings and busy roads. But city life is not easy. With their roots buried beneath tarmac and stone, it's remarkable that trees on the street can survive at all. At first glance, they seem inert and still. But just beneath the bark, trees are intricate living machines. Pipework that puts even the most complicated of human plumbing to shame pumps water, minerals and food between roots and leaves. Damage to the bark can destroy the pipes within. The powerhouse of every tree is its canopy of green. Each leaf is a miniature miracle of engineering. They capture the energy of pure sunshine and use it to turn water and air into sugar and starch, their food. Like any intricate machine, trees are sensitive to change, and their chemistry is easily upset. Just a few seconds' carelessness can kill. Here's a, a very sad story. This magnificent plane tree, which is, what, about 100 years old, has been killed by a herbicide, a herbicide called imazapir. Now, herbicides are fine in the right place. They can do a good cleaning up job. And the herbicide was actually applied all over this area just to keep weeds under control. What nobody realized was that the plane tree is susceptible to the herbicide and that its roots are actually very close under the paving stones. Let's have a look. Now, yes, look. 
there's some roots here uh, just running under the surface. Sadly, though, there are nowhere near as many roots as there were when I looked at this last year, when the tree was in the throes of its death. They've all been killed. And, of course, the, this sort of situation occurs under paving stones in, in all sorts of places. So if you use a herbicide like this, you can get uh, serious damage. Very sad. The problem is nationwide and totally unnecessary because there are safe chemicals. It's not only planes that are killed. This lime has also been hit by pavement herbicides. The sucker growth on the trunk is the tree's attempt to stave off death by trying to make more food. But it has failed. The canopy is already dying back. Soon, this whole avenue will be dead, and then gone. When trees die, it is not just the landscape that suffers. Every city tree is a complex ecosystem, home for wildlife that otherwise would not survive in town. Most of it is hidden high amongst the leaves. I'm standing in a lime tree, and um, probably it's about 80 feet tall. And it's amazing the amount of life that there is. There'll be tens of thousands of individuals of probably hundreds of different species of insects, spiders, wood lice, lace wings, and all sorts of things. Um, let's see what we've got in the net. Let's have a look. We've got some aphids here on a leaf with some young ladybird larvae. There's a tiger moth caterpillar. Uh, we've got a single older ladybird larva, uh, a cream spot adult ladybird, and, and a 14 spot ladybird. Each species of tree supports its own unique mix of life. And trees that are native to the British Isles, like oaks, birch and ash, have the most animals of all. A tree supports thousands of insects, because its leaves contain huge quantities of potential food. The flush of fresh leaves in spring are the most nutritious of all, and caterpillars time their emergence to fit. Insects, in turn, are food for birds. Because the biggest crop of caterpillars coincides with the first leaves, this is when blue tits and other birds raise their young. Later in the year, flowers, seeds and berries also sustain wildlife. Leaves feed insects, insects feed small birds, small birds make meals for bigger birds. Sparrowhawks hunt and even breed right in the heart of town, but only if there are large old trees. Almost all the birds you see in towns and cities depend in one way or another on trees for food, shelter or nest sites. The urban forest brings the countryside downtown. Changes through the seasons introduce the rhythms of nature into the inner city.
city trees provide a psychological link to the countryside, but they can do much more. They can transform the urban landscape dramatically for the benefit of people. Well, this is a section of the old Belfast and County Down Railway. It runs through the heart of East Belfast. And I came through the first time about 12 years ago. And really then it was a very unpleasant, underused, abused piece of land. But some people saw that there was a potential resource here for the community. The whole place, people used to drive in from the far end off the Bearsbridge Road and just dump. The place was a local dump in the area. There was bedspreads, there was rubbish, you name it, there was fridges, it was here. There was not one tree growing on the walkway itself, on the bed of the railway. But we knew that with a bit of concentration and a bit of effort, we could turn this into a real resource. So what it was like 12 years ago, very unpleasant. It was not a nice piece of land at all. Didn't have a good feeling. But now I think you can see after 12 years, something very amazing has happened and has taken place. In little more than a decade, there is now a wonderful wild woodland for walking, playing, and learning about nature firsthand. And it'll become even better as time goes on. Belfast is not the only place in Britain where imaginative tree planting is breathing life into derelict urban landscapes. In the 1980s, Knowsley near Liverpool had huge areas of wasteland, the sites of old factories closed by recession. Today, it couldn't be more different. The woodlands are not just pleasant, their freshness in contrast to the previous air of decay is attracting new investment into one of the most deprived areas of the country. Who would imagine that this was once a scene of industrial dereliction? Bristol city centre 20 years ago. With a mild climate, it is one of the most favourable places in Britain for young trees. Once a blighted landscape of dirt, rubble and temporary car parks, this is now a leafy park, an oasis in the inner city. But not all young trees do so well. Every year, thousands die through sheer neglect. Baby trees need looking after, but often that doesn't happen. Newly planted saplings have few roots and require frequent watering. Even grass has more effective roots, and so if young trees are not well watered, it can steal most of the moisture from them, and they simply die of drought. The neglect of young trees wastes millions of pounds of public money every year. And in one way or other, grass is often part of the problem. Nobody likes to see grass growing round trees. They perhaps think it looks untidy, and they also perhaps have some idea that it might be competing with the trees. So what do they do? The strimmer seems the absolute salvation, and they use the trimmer tightly round the tree. But what they don't appreciate is that it's causing the most appalling amount of damage to the base. Just look at this. The bark's been ripped off. Good God. It's actually been ripped off all the way round there. That's about two-thirds of the bark has been lost. That's impressive. Oh, look at this one. It's absolutely hopeless. It's actually nearly ringed completely. There's only a quarter left. The tree's doomed. I don't know what, what one can say. Um, it's not going to die. This is the trouble immediately. It may not die for two or three years. It's a pity these trees won't scream when they're hurt like this. Then people would pay more attention. Oh, Lord. It looks like vandalism. But, you know, I bet it's not. It's obviously broken away from its, its ties and is lying on the ground now, but what's happened down here? Oh, no. Look at this. Just typical of what can happen. Um, this has been very badly damaged by strimmers, even to the extent of about three-quarters of the bark has been removed. 
Uh, this tree was doomed as soon as it got this degree of, of strimmer damage. In this one park, at least 90% of the trees have been damaged by strimmers. Some have also been strangled by their supporting ties or torn down by vandals. In planting schemes throughout Britain, it's not uncommon for half the trees to die, and in some locations, none survive at all. To stand a chance, young trees need a great deal of care. And with the lowest tree cover in Europe, nowhere is success more vital than in Northern Ireland. This nursery on the outskirts of Belfast raises and cares for over 100,000 seedlings each year. The nursery here has in fact been the backbone now for the last 10 years of a campaign that we've been running to plant one million trees throughout Northern Ireland. Now the success of it has been based on involving people, ordinary people like you and me, involving them in the process of planting the trees and caring for the trees. By planting trees grown from locally collected seed, the project aims not only to improve the environment of Northern Ireland, but also to perpetuate its heritage of indigenous trees. I'm always in awe at just how abundant, how bountiful the natural world is. If you just look at this one seed bed of ash, this was planted probably about three months ago, and just look at the profusion. Now you imagine if you bring together the enthusiasm of people, people's love of trees, if you bring that together with this bountifulness of nature, but also what's very important, a real technical understanding, uh, a knowledge of the requirements of each individual tree, bring those three together and just think what a difference we're going to be able to make to our landscape. The entire bed probably holds about 5,000 trees. If we can plant and care for all these trees, then the quality of our life undoubtedly is going to be improved. Such enthusiasm for trees inspired the Victorians over a hundred years ago. They completed grand planting schemes in cities and towns throughout the land. Now, after a century of growth, their avenues and parks are in their prime. And we are reaping the reward. The Victorians planted everywhere. In the heart of Wolverhampton, this park is just one example of their vision of cities full of great forest trees. After 120 years, it has finally matured. The full benefits of urban trees come with age and size. In winter, large trees intercept the wind, and in the middle of summer, they provide shade. The water loss from their leaves actually cools the air around, and on really hot days, a large tree can provide cooling equivalent to five average-sized air conditioners. The climate in a well-wooded city is much more bearable, and foliage also soaks up noise. Even in the centre of London, in a mature park, the sound of traffic may be absorbed completely. Big trees make towns and cities so much more relaxing places to be. For children living in cities, trees and the wildlife that lives in them may be their only real contact with nature. A mature urban forest can have a remarkably therapeutic effect on us all.
I'm absolutely convinced that I need my own personal daily dose of contact with nature. And judging by the park today, I'm not the only one, because as soon as there's a bit of sunshine and a half an hour spare time, a lot of people migrate to the nearest patch of green, because there's something just very refreshing about being amongst trees. But actually, there's more to it than that, because there's a growing amount of evidence to suggest that patients in hospital, for instance, who have a view out of their window that's got trees and leafiness out there, actually make a more rapid recovery. They actually get better faster. Improved climate, contact with nature, help with relaxation and recovery. The benefits of city trees seem almost endless. They also help in the fight against one of the greatest modern threats to health, traffic. BBC Radio Oxford Weather Watch. Hot and sunny with temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius. The air quality in Oxford city centre is poor. Low level ozone over many parts of England and Wales, so some very poor air quality there. Motorists are urged to cut their journeys as pollution levels rise. Will the request fall on deaf ears? There are over 25 million vehicles on Britain's roads, and that number is rising. With so much traffic in towns, it's not just the noise that people are worried about now. There's a real concern about the air pollution that's generated. One in seven young children now suffering from asthma. And in the fight against pollution, the trees alongside the roads really are very important. It's the hot, sunny days in the middle of summer that really are the worst days for breathing sufferers. That's when the traffic pollution gets worst. And that's rather convenient because it's the leaves on the trees through the summer that do this pollution cleanup job. They absorb the chemicals right through the growing season. And then in the autumn, when the leaves turn yellow and fall to the ground, those pollutants are taken out of the environment. Trees absorb an enormous range of pollutants sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, ozone and lead. They also remove dust and the tiny particles from diesel engines, which aggravate lung problems. A road without trees may have 10 times more dust than a similar tree-lined street. The Department of Transport plants thousands of trees per mile of new motorway to combat the impact of heavy traffic. Cleaning up pollution, along with all their other benefits, gives urban trees a significant economic value, many hundreds of millions of pounds a year at least. Trees are both beautiful and beneficial and lots of people love them. So when they're threatened by development, protests are often long and hard. The construction of roads, supermarkets and housing leads to the cutting down of thousands of trees. Large numbers of people protest. But far more trees are dying on development sites all over the country without a whisper of complaint. Simply piling rubble around the roots can kill by slow suffocation in the severely compacted soil, and almost nobody notices. With regard to private properties, the single biggest threat is development. In this particular example, what we have is a housing unit being built very close to an overmature tree. Before the site has really got going, we have materials being stored in and under the trees. We will have changes in grade, we will have compaction, we will have root disturbance. These trees will be some of the oldest trees in this city, and they cannot withstand that sort of pressure. Damaged trees may take years to die, and so when they finally expire, 
the original cause is rarely identified. But there is no excuse for ignorance. This country has world-beating standards with regard to trees in relation to construction. What this standard would have to say with regard to this particular tree is that it would require an absolute minimum of between 9 and 12 metres to have a safe distance to maintain it. As you can see in this particular example, that distance is in actual fact half a metre. The building is so close that the tree will probably be identified as a danger and have to be felled. One of the commonest forms of damage is to roots. They're often cut when foundations are excavated or driveways dug. It may take years for a large tree to die, but with severed roots, there is only one outcome. We built this house in 1986, uh, when it was two years old. Uh, and at that stage, the house didn't have a name, and we so liked the beech tree in the front garden that we called the house Beach House. I suppose uh, hindsight is, uh, is easy for anybody, but perhaps the people who planned the, uh, the little mini estate here um, should have recognised that uh, putting tarmac down and uh, so on, developing as they have done, has caused the tree to uh, die, and, and that's a shame, really. If we could buy one off the shelf uh, of similar uh, age and appearance, uh, we would do so, but uh, that's not available to us. And so we have to live with uh, having destroyed a tree, really. Construction inevitably involves disturbance, and building sites are always messy. But it need not lead to the destruction of trees. Forethought is all it takes. Simple precautions, like protective fencing, ensure that trees survive, to be enjoyed by the new owners and people passing by. Trees not only look beautiful on housing estates, they're valuable too. Their presence can add up to 10% to property prices, and houses in a tree-lined street are often easier to sell. With careful planning, trees can survive in even the most concrete of jungles. The city of London. Here in the most built-up corner of the country, large trees struggle for space, and there is almost no natural soil for new planting. The streets of the city of London are really inhospitable places when it comes to trying to find sites for tree planting. Because outside in the footway, there's all the services, the British Telecom and the gas board and the underground and so on. So we have to be very inventive. Look for sites where there's natural soil. And this is a beautiful example. We're now in an underground car park. So the natural soil is down there. So what we do is we take out a hole, two meters by two meters by two meters, into there, put even better soil, then plant a tree into it. Now this tree has been here for 25, 30 years, and it's gone right up there. It's going to be 50, 60 feet up in the air. People look down on that from the flats on this side, and the offices all around. So hopefully what we're doing here is adding to the tree population of the city of London, so that one day, from every corner, you can see some greenery, or at least one tree in this city. an urban forest thriving in a concrete jungle, even if it does need a lot of effort and imagination. Like growing a stand of planes in a huge box 40 feet above the ground. Forests, buildings and people all crowded together throw up problems. London has over 10 million people and 6 million trees. <laughs> 